Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2023 Annual Conference and Book Fair in Seattle, Washington. I am Chris Biak, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. Here's a visual description of myself. I'm a blonde poet in a blue dress. <laughs> the Association of Writers and Writing Programs is a small but mighty nonprofit organization that amplifies the voices of writers and the academic programs and organizations that serve them, all while championing diversity and excellence in creative writing. I am a member of AWP's Board of Directors, but first and foremost, I am a member of AWP. Membership with AWP provides me with writing resources year-round, but just as importantly, it allows me to support other writers, especially those who are just starting out. My membership dues help writers find meaningful careers and publication opportunities and make services like Writer to Writer Mentorship Program possible. <clears throat> if you aren't already, I invite you to become a member today. Together we are AWP. We are delighted to bring you this event today. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our conference sponsors and the literary partner hosting this event, Copper Canyon Press. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. Please join me in thanking all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. Now before we start, I do need to do some brief housekeeping. Please silence your cell phones. Remember, there is no flash photography allowed during the presentation. Respect seats marked as reserved for attendees with accessibility needs. Please give the authors about 10 minutes after the presentation to get to the book signing table out in the hallway before approaching them to have your book signed. And lastly, we ask that you please be aware of your fellow attendees who may have disabilities and help AWP be more accessible, specifically if you see a barrier to accessibility, let us know by calling or texting our accessibility hotline at 240-269-6635. Please also be aware of those with invisible disabilities and do not question someone's use of an accommodation. Thank you, and now it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Michael Wiegers, executive editor of Copper Canyon Press, who will introduce this fantastic event. Thank you um, for joining us uh, uh, today. You know, there's so much going on around here, great panels and readings and the book fair. So we know that you can spend your time elsewhere and we're grateful that you're, you're here among us. Um, Copper Canyon um, uh, is launching its uh, 50th anniversary celebrations uh, with the publication of our book, A House Called Tomorrow, which um, just published last week. And over the, the past five decades, we've m remained solely committed uh, to poetry. Um, you know, and um, I've been fortunate to be a part of the press for 30 of those years, and I'm really humbled by the work we've built together. And when I when I think of the work, the the we in that, I don't mean just you know the in, incredible staff and board and volunteers and and others who have made the press, but but also most notably our poets, uh, many of whom are out in the audience tonight, as well as. Um, uh, all of you who are readers and uh, and have been a part of the the, the press um, through throughout the years, um, you know, really without uh, without your participation, we wouldn't um, exist. Um, and you know, I um, you know, as I as I walk around the the book fair, particularly um, as somebody again who's been doing this for um, for quite a while, I'm always. Um, amazed by by what I encounter there. You know, not just um, running into old friends and mentors and and people I've had the privilege of working with over the years, but but also meeting uh, meeting new people, meeting poets that I've I've never met, but we've started working on uh, books together. Um, you know, I think of you know a number of you know books that uh, I've signed in the past year, and this is the first time that I get to meet. Uh, 
some of the, the poets that are coming to the press. And it's also uh, often the first time I get to meet poets that we will publish, you know, people who are here coming and introducing themselves to us and striking up conversations uh, about their work. And so that, that I think, is uh, a really thrilling part of of being here as an editor. And if you look at you know, the title of that book, A House Called Tomorrow, that's really what we're, we're hoping to celebrate as the press. Yes, we're looking back at a legacy that uh, includes you know, many people, including you know, some, our, our original founders. I think uh, I spotted at least one of them here this evening, uh, or this, uh, this afternoon, I guess it is. Um, I'm, I'm still on last night, I guess. Um, but, um, but it's um, you know so it's um, um, it's it's you know thrilling to you know be among all of the the potential that's at this conference and to be reminded you know this is why we do what we do. Um, so when I try to you know think of um, the, the our list, um, my hope is that it will be um, seen as something that's full of recognizable surprises. Um, I believe that we make books. Um, in order to make traditions anew, um, tr extending you know issues of legacy of those who came before us, um, you know, and I think by understanding the concerns of of poets um, over the years, um, concerns that they've puzzled on, puzzled over um, before us. Um, um, we not only you know further their investigations, but we make them our own. Again, the the title of that that anthology, House Called Tomorrow, um, is something that is really forward looking, not backward looking. And yet, the book itself is compiled by asking our community of poets, of readers, of donors, of of board members, of interns, everybody who's touched the press over the years, to to suggest a favorite poem. And so, uh, my my goal in in constructing that book was not to have it be Michael's history, but you know the history of this community that we've we've built together. And when I read it, I'm incredibly proud of all the people who have supported the press. And the title of the poem, I'll say, is kind of a um, is kind of emblematic of that process. You know, um, 30 years ago when I started, we start we we began the the practice of beginning and ending all of our meetings with a poem, reading a poem. And so each each person was able to give voice to a poem that they loved. And it was during one of the meetings when I was gathering all the all the various poems that our financial manager read Alberto Rios's poem, A House Called Tomorrow. I was like, that's the title of the anthology. So it's really something that's that's given uh, it's it's arrived. The whole press has arrived on the voices of of many others, um, and you know. And so I hope you'll have a a look uh, down at the book fair, at um, you know the the anthology and at our list, which um, is a, I hope again remarkably diverse and and um, and looking both uh, simultaneously into the future as well as uh, to the to the um, uh, past. Um, so. Um, tonight, um, we're going to start and, and um, read it. You know, I, again, I hope that you know, you'll get a sense of the breadth of the press by the, the poets who are reading uh, with us today. Um, and um, we're going to read in alphabetical order. And, I, and rather than um, uh, tell you, you know, the bios that you can find easily on our website or find on Wikipedia. I just want to maybe give some personal comments about each of them. Um, so um, I feel incredibly connected to Ellen Bass um, in terms of my entry into poetry. When I was a young college student, I was I was a biology major, and you know to to maybe date uh, myself a little bit, I I ended up taking a class. It was my first literature class, and it was. Um, uh, women's literature, um, which you know, I kind of um, laugh a little bit at, at that um, at that class title now, but that's that's where I first um, read Ellen's uh, uh, groundbreaking anthology, No More Masks, and that's where I first read your your poems. And um, Ellen, of course, went on to have a remarkable career. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, of course, her you know really uh, groundbreaking. Um, 
um, an important book about survival, A Courage to Heal, um, which, um, you know, uh, after she finished that, she ended up, you know, um, re, um, returning to the world of poetry, if, if I can say that. And, um, and it was just thrilling, this, this person who I had met through her poems as, as a young man was suddenly um, coming to Copper Canyon as, uh, as uh, a poet and you know, as one of my heroes. Um, so, um, Ellen, please. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is, I just couldn't be happier uh, to be with any press than Copper Canyon. You know what great work they publish and they're also just so kind and thoughtful and I couldn't believe it when I landed here and I'm just honored to read with all of you here today. This poem is called The Morning After. You stand at the counter, pouring boiling water over the French roast, oily perfume rising in smoke. And when I enter, you don't look up. You're hurrying to pack your lunch, snapping the lids on little plastic boxes while you call your mother to tell her you'll take her to the doctor. I can't see a trace of the little slice of heaven we slipped into last night, a silk kimono floating satin ponds and copper koi, stars falling to the water. Didn't we shoulder our way through the cleft in the rock of the everyday and tear up the grass in the pasture of pleasure? If the soul isn't a separate vessel we carry from form to form, but more like Aristotle's breath of life, the work of the body that keeps it whole, then last night, darling, our souls were busy, but this morning, it's like you're wearing a bad wig, disguised so I won't recognize you, or maybe so you won't know yourself as that animal burned down to pure desire. I don't know how you do it. I want to throw myself onto the kitchen tile and bare my throat. I want to slick back my hair and tap dance up the wall. I want to do it all, all over again dive back into that brawl, that raw and radiant free-for-all. But you are scribbling a shopping list because the kids are coming for the weekend and you're going to make your special crab cakes that have ruined me for all other crab cakes forever. Thank you. This next poem happened um, because my wife and I were concerned about the um, way that the meat that we ate was raised when it was animals, and we started um, investigating how to get more uh, sustainably raised chickens, and we weren't happy with anything that we found. And finally, um, some young friends who were raising their own chickens asked if we wanted them to raise some for us. And that seemed like an ideal situation, and we said yes. I didn't know anything about chickens or raising chickens. And so I was surprised three months later, they called up and said, it's time to slaughter the chickens, do you want to help? And I said yes, because I thought that I should be, I wanted to be uh, willing to kill something if I was going to eat it. And this is the poem that arose from my investigation of that experience. It's called, What Did I Love? What did I love about killing the chickens? Let me start with the drive to the farm as darkness was sinking back into the earth, the road damp and shining like the snail's silver ribbon and the orchard with its bony branches. I loved the yellow rubber apron and the way Janet knotted my broken strap and the stainless steel altars we bleached, Brian sharpening the knives, testing the edge on his thumbnail, all 88 Cornish hens huddled in their crates, wrapping my palms around their white wings, lowering them into the tapered urn. Some seemed unwitting as the world narrowed 
Some cackled and fluttered, some struggled. I gathered each one, tucked her bright feet, drew her head through the kill cone's sharp collar. Her keratin beak and the rumpled red vascular comb that once kept her cool as she pecked in her mansion of grass. I didn't look into those stone eyes. I didn't ask forgiveness. I slid the blade between the feathers and made quick crescent cuts, severing the arteries just under the jaw, blood like liquor pouring out of the bottle. When I see the nub of heart later, it's hard to believe such a small star could flare like that. I lifted each body, bathing it in heated water until the scaly membrane of the shanks sloughed off under my thumb. And after they were tossed in the large plucking drum, I loved the newly naked birds, sundering the heads and feet neatly at the joints, a poor man's riches for golden stock, slitting a fissure, reaching into the chamber, freeing the organs, the spill of intestines, blue-tinged gizzard, the small purses of lungs, the royal hearts, easing the floppy liver carefully from the green gallbladder, its bitter bile, and the fascia unfurling like a transparent fan. When I tug the esophagus down through the neck, I love the suck and release as it lets go, then slicing off the anus with its gray pearl of shit. Over and over, my hands explore each cave, learning to see with my fingertips. Like a traveler in a foreign country, entering church after church. In every one, the same figures of the Madonna, Christ on the cross, which I'd always thought was gore, until Marie said to her it was tender, the most tender image, every saint and political prisoner every jailed poet and burning monk. But though I have all the time in the world to think thoughts like this, I don't. I'm empty as I rinse each carcass, and this is what I love most. It's like when the refrigerator turns off and you hear the silence. As the sun rose higher, we shed our sweatshirts and moved the coolers into the shade. But other than that, no time passed. I didn't get hungry. I didn't want to stop. I was breathing from some bright reserve. We twisted each pullet into plastic, iced and loaded them in the cars. I loved the truth, even in just this one thing, looking straight at the terrible one-sided accord we make with the living of this world. At the end, we scoured the tables, hosed the dried blood, the stain blossoming through the water. Indigo. As I'm walking on Westcliff Drive, a man runs toward me pushing one of those jogging strollers with shock absorbers so the baby can keep sleeping, which this baby is. I can just get a glimpse of its almost translucent eyelids. The father is young, a jungle of indigo and carnelian tattooed from knuckle to jaw, leafy vines and blossoms, saints and symbols. Thick wooden plugs pierce his lobes, and his sunglasses testify to the radiance haloed around him. I'm so jealous, as I often am. It's a kind of obsession. I want him to have been my child's father. I want to have married a man who wanted to be in a body, who wanted to live in it so much that he marked it up like a book, underlining, highlighting, writing in the margins, I was here not like my dead ex-husband, who was always fighting against the flesh, who sat for hours on his Zafu chanting Om, and then went out and broke his hand punching the car. I imagine when this galloping man gets home, he's going to want to have sex with his wife, who slept in late 
and then he'll eat barbecued ribs and let the baby teeth on a bone while he drinks a dark beer. I can't stop wishing my daughter had had a father like that. I can't stop wishing I'd had that life. Oh, I know, it's a miracle to have a life, any life at all. It took eight years for my parents to conceive me. First there was the war, and then just waiting. And my mother's bones so narrow, she had to be slit and I airlifted. That anyone is born, each precarious success from sperm and egg to zygote, embryo, infant, is a wonder. And here I am alive, almost 70 years and nothing has killed me. Not the car I totaled running a stop sign or the spirochete that screwed into my blood. Not the tree that fell in the forest exactly where I was standing, my best friend shoving me backward so I fell on my ass as it crashed. I'm alive, and I gave birth to a child. So she didn't get a father who'd sling her onto his shoulder, and so much else she didn't get. I've cried most of my life over that. And now there's everything that we can't talk about. We love, but cannot take too much of each other. Yet, she is the one who, when I asked her to kill me if I no longer had my mind, we were on our way into Ross shopping for dresses. That's something she likes, and they all look adorable on her. She's the only one who didn't hesitate or refuse or waver or flinch. As we strode across the parking lot, she said, okay, but when's the cutoff? That's what I need to know. And I'll end with uh, a newer poem, How to Apologize. Cook a large fish. Choose one with many bones. A skeleton you will need skill to expose. Maybe the flying silver carp that's invading the Great Lakes, tumbling the others into oblivion. If you don't live near a lake, you'll have to travel. Walking is best and shows you mean it. But you could take a train and let yourself be soothed by the rocking on the rails. It's permitted to receive solace for whatever you did or didn't do. Pitiful, beautiful, human. When my mother was in the hospital, my daughter and I had to clear out the home she wouldn't return to. Then she recovered and asked, incredulous, how could you have thrown out all my shoes? So you'll need a boat. You could rent or buy. But for the sake of repairing the world, build your own. Thin strips of western red cedar are perfect, but don't cut a tree. There'll be a demolished barn or downed trunk if you fend your further, and someone will have a mill, and someone will loan you tools. The perfume of sawdust and the curls that fall from your plane will sweeten the hours. Each night, we dream 36 billion dreams. In one night, we could dream back everything lost. So grill the pale flesh. Unharness yourself from your weary stories. Then carry the oily, succulent fish to the one you hurt. There is much to fear as a creature caught in time, but this is safe. You need no defense. This is just another way to know you are alive. Thank you. So next to read is going to be Amanda Gunn, and I just want to say about uh, her and her work. Um, and, you know, she sent a manuscript to me a while ago, and I didn't know a whole lot about her. And uh, a mutual friend said, "Pay attention." I read this book and fell in love with it, starting with her uh, wonderful um, uh, her poems that are filled with perfume and. Uh, a sequence on Harriet Tubman that was just um, really, really caught my attention from the start. And around the same time, uh, Amanda entered uh, the, the Stegner program at Stanford. And a friend of mine um, who was working there said, 
damn, she writes some good poems. Uh, but I had never heard her read um, in person until yesterday, and I was just floored by your reading, and you know, was so excited to hear you read again today. And um, you know, 50 years from now, again, looking toward tomorrow, 50 years from now, um, this room is going to be full of people looking uh, to hear Amanda again, and all of you will be able to say, hey, way back when, I saw her at the start. And so, not to put any pressure on you, <laughs> so, but please welcome Amanda. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's so nice to see so many familiar and also new faces. Um, I'm going to read one of the poems from my sequence on Harriet Tubman. Um, and this particular one was written just, or not, not too long after it was announced that her face would be on the new $20 bill. Thirty-nine objects at the Smithsonian, and now your face on the dollar you dared to subvert, covertly moving in the marsh. Mud slalom, old boots are none, guns and fire, and nigger, I'm coming for you. Nigger, I'll have your black hide. Nigger, I'll bleed you like a pig. Nigger, sister, sister. I meditated you here from a pillow, white cotton and soft. I brought it back to the breath and the breath brought me you, my mind unrested. What doubts tested you? How did you walk into that first night in the dark, knee deep through the murmuring creek, the stars cloaked in cloud and your fellow's fear, a stack of bills the prize for your fragile dear throat, bills weighed against your body on God's damned scales. Memory fails. I recall just three things from the tongue my lover taught me, three things her love bought me. Hello, I love you. How much does it cost? What did having holding cost? Leaving him there too. How many twenties would have bought you? How many twenties to sell you south, rebirth you in the mouth of America? They called you minty back then mint leaves scenting the dooryard, mint jelly for master's lamb, a mint he made off your good strong back, good strong teeth, golden fresh wheat in your good strong hands. Yesterday, I gave away a 20 on the street, a Jackson, an accident of birth in my pocket, and the woman's face like a torch caught light. I turned my head, still and always insufficient to the day, Shamed to have praised my own self. Oh, Harriet, woman most equal to your time, you hover there above my hewn, fine desk, dark, deadly, dead and alive, knife keen and waiting and resolute, not knowing me or needing me, just wanting, perhaps, that war pension raise, that cool 20 you were promised from the house. So the next poem um, is a poem I wrote, really, I was thinking about the, um, the women in my family, the, the female elders in my family, and um, their legacy of food and, and nourishment. Um, it's called Ordinary Sugar. Aunt Mary made graham cracker cake without measuring cups divided one pound light brown sugar with a knife, half for the cake and half for the pearlescent, hand-beaten, double-boiled icing. Aunt Erlene made yellow cake with frosting of real fudge, 234 degrees and all, slow-cooled, poured just before the rapid and irrevocable hardening. Ordinary sugar, coaxed to its epiphany. 
An heir to their confectionery sleight of hand, I keep their notes pressed in a book and safe. Sugar is poison to my arthritic knees, but their recipes will rest nonetheless pristine, not spoiled with things that just seem sweet. I'll make savory dishes out of what grows green, what snaps pleasurably, what must, after twice the loss of such women, be plenty. Of Grandma Maddie, sugar alchemist, it is said, if they were all she had to hand, she could make sweet potato pie out of russets, seduce their pale starches until they tumbled into caramel. What the loving, living tell. I remember her gleaming glass eye, her pregnant wordlessness, her spinning through the kitchen hot and fast, to the ruthless, manic canning, putting by, putting by, against memories too near starvation, the machine in her belly built to last. I do not have preserved in my book how she seasoned her pear chow chow or trapped the summer gardens her labors made lush. I know only that she fed the earth her eggshells and morning coffee grounds, that she harvested continually and in fullness the tender skins near breaking, near sugar, always before the chill. Not one bite lost. She'd mastered in a life how to grow a winter meal, to till, to weed, to water, to tend. Learned how, I hope, to be satisfied. Oh. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> I just took a deep breath. <laughs> Help me, Lord, to be satisfied. I was born impatient under a vibrating star, but my mother taught me gently before it ached us both to stand, how to slice fat into cold flour, sprinkle ice water by tablespoons, form a perfect discus of dough without touching it, unfurl the crust from a good French pin, brush with milk, a proper flute, taught me too how to discern and sort and sugar down the fruit, and when to fill the plate and when to wait instead for the juice to come in. <laughs> okay, so the last poem I'm gonna read uh, is the final poem in the book, and um, it's a poem that appears after a, a book of um, sort of contemplating the possibilities of motherhood and and having children and and uh, the sort of thing that happens when that becomes foreclosed uh, through time. It's called Like This. Okay. Like this. Erica says, melodies, prayers, babies. A woman who isn't asked says nothing. A woman who isn't a mother fields questions. A woman who isn't a mother owns a field. My mother holds my knee. My mother's left hand is a wooden shield. My mother tells her cousin when she's ready. A woman who waits. Erica says, we give birth to different things. A woman who knows the difference says poems. A mother slices a pepper like a heart. A mother says like this. My mother holds a braid, holds the milk, holds a chrysalis. 
One mother says, you dodged a bullet. A woman who waits, waits for a sound in her heart. A doctor says, what saves you? What saves my life will burst a baby's heart. A doctor says, choose. My mother's hand in the car hits my heart. A mother's grief arrives already swaddled. A mother with ashes for children says, Ishtanem. The woman who birthed my mother says, maybe. A woman who's no longer asked says, nothing. Erica says, birth things. A woman who makes a choice works a field. My mother taught my hands to crimp the pastry. I taught my mother's hands to lattice pastry. The woman who birthed my mother says prayers. My mother holds a needle, holds a feather, holds a door. When a doctor says choose, a death is meted. A poem says the same each time you meet it. A woman who doesn't choose crosses a field. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so our next reader um, is uh, Bill Porter, who um, is known as the translator Red Pine. And um, Bill has been with the press for 40 years when we first published his book, The Collected Songs of Cold Mountain. And I'll just say that personally, he's been with me, um, you know, every day that I leave my home. I've, you know, since before I was at Copper Canyon Press, I was working at a sister press coffee house. We had a broadside uh, made of one of his poems uh, by, by Cold Mountain, where in the poem, Cold Mountain is sitting in his home and, um, and you know, meditating and realizes, you know, from there he can travel the universe. And, and it ends with the line, uh, from here I can go anywhere, everywhere is perfect. And that's what greets me every morning that I leave my house or go out for walks around town. And Bill actually lives in Port Townsend, so sometimes we cross ways because he walks a good five miles or so along the beach um, every day and, and is religiously uh, out in, in um, the, the trees and paths and streets of Port Townsend. And um, it's, you know, um, been our pleasure in this you know, past year to publish a retrospective of his work, um, The Essential Red Pine, uh, and I hope you'll all take a chance to look at that uh, um, in the book fair as well. But um, Bill, please. Thank you all for coming. Um, poetry doesn't get a lot of respect. It's great to, to see you here. Um, I, uh, I don't write poems, I translate them. And this first poem is uh, this, uh, from the oldest book of poetry in, in China. It's written around 500 BC. Imagine a small state with a small population. Let there be labor-saving tools that aren't used. Let people consider death and not move far. Let there be boats and carts, but no reason to ride them. Let there be armor and weapons, but no reason to employ them. Let people return to the use of knots and be satisfied with their food and pleased with their clothing and content with their homes and happy with their customs. And let there be another state so near, people hear its dogs and chickens, but live out their lives without making a visit. It's a poem by Lao Tzu, yeah. the, the penult penultimate poem in the, the Tao Te Ching. So you can see that poetry had a special place in, in China. It was uh, personal, but it was also political. It was about poets like to, to tell other people how they should live their lives, and by telling them how they live their lives. Um, 
The most admired poet in Chinese history is a man named Tao Yuanming. He lived around 400 AD. Um, he's, not, he's one of the greatest poets, but if you had, had to ask Chinese who they loved the most, everybody would say Tao Yuanming. The reason is he uh, served the two most powerful men in the kingdom, um, both of whom eventually murdered the emperor and established their own dynasties. And, uh, and then he said, uh, the hell with that, and uh, went home and spent the rest of his life, uh, 27 years, as a farmer. And he wrote this poem the day he quit, uh, returning to my garden and fields. I was socially awkward when I was young. I preferred hills and mountains instead. By mistake, I fell into a net of illusions. I was gone for 13 years. But a bird on a tether longs for the woods, and a fish in a pond recalls the old depths. So I cleared some land in the hills south of town. Choosing to be simple, I came back to farm. My property includes more than three acres. My thatch house is maybe nine posts wide. Elms and willows shade the eaves in back. Fruit trees spread before the door. The nearest town is off in the haze. Smoke, hang, smoke hangs above the village houses. A dog barks in a distant lane. A cock crows atop a mulberry tree. There's no dust or trash in my yard. My house is empty, but filled with peace. No longer imprisoned in a cage, I'm back again, and I'm free. So he spent the last 27 seven years of his life uh, trying to be a farmer. Uh, he wasn't that successful, because he was always hungry. Um, but there's another poem he wrote uh, in reply to Liu, Liu of Jaisang, who was a fellow recluse. Few people visit such a poor place. Sometimes I forget about the seasons until falling leaves cover the yard, and sadly, I realize it's autumn. Even with sunflowers lighting the north window and grain nodding in the fields to the south, still, I can't feel happy not knowing if I'll have another year. I tell my wife to bring the children. It's a perfect day for a hike. Um, the next poet is, is uh, the one that uh, Michael just mentioned, Han Shan or Cold Mountain was the first poet I ever translated. I never planned to, I never planned to, I, I don't write poetry and I certainly never planned to translate it. But one day I was living in a Buddhist monastery for three years and and uh, about halfway through that three years, the abbot called me into his, his office and, and gave me this book. He said, I, I, I've, I helped uh, finance the publication, so I got some copies. And he gave me the poems of Cold Mountain. And uh, he said, you may want to try translating some of them. And so I did. And one day after I left the monastery, I was living in a farming village in Taiwan for uh, the next 14 years. And an American knocked on, knocked on my door one day and said, I hear you're working on Cold Mountain. Do you need a publisher? And so that's why I'm here. A couple of poems by Cold Mountain. Uh, you know, these, these, these poems like by the, Dao, the Lao Tzu and Tao Yuanming uh, have, this, have this theme that runs through them is, I would rather be home farming than, than serving in the government. Um, a long time ago, about 5,000 years ago, the emperor, Emperor Yao, tried to give his throne to a hermit named Siyo. And Siyo was so insulted, he walked down to a stream and washed out his ears. So the residue of those words wouldn't, wouldn't remain. So here's Cold Mountain's uh, poem. Uh, when he was 30 years ago, well, after 30 years, he just disappeared. Nobody, incidentally, nobody knows his real name. He's the only significant poet in all of Chinese history whose name we don't know. Han Shan, Cold Mountain. Born 30 years ago, I've traveled countless miles along rivers where the, where the green rushes swayed to the frontier where the red dust swirled. I've made elixirs and tried to become immortal. I've read the classics and written odes. And now I've retired to Cold Mountain to lie in a stream and wash out my ears. People ask the way to Cold Mountain, but roads don't reach Cold Mountain. In summer, the ice doesn't melt. Sunny days, the fog is too dense. 
So how did someone like me arrive? Our minds are not the same. If they were the same, you would be here. When I was translating Cold Mountain, I was using eventually a Qing Dynasty woodblock edition that had other poets in it. And the poet right after Cold Mountain was a, a, a Buddhist monk named Stonehouse. And so I translated his poetry too. Here's a couple poems by Stonehouse. Who, uh, Cold Mountain lived around 800 AD. Stonehouse lived around 1300. Trying to become, and incidentally, Stonehouse lived on this mountain for 35 years. And uh, eventually, uh, I found his old hut uh, in the place where he was buried. So this is uh, some from the mountain poems of Stonehouse. Trying to become a Buddha is easy, but ending delusions is hard. How many frosty moonlit nights have I sat and felt the cold before dawn? Head of white hair, shoulders, all bones. I've lived in a hut more years than I can count. My shorts have no drawstring and my pants, no legs, and half of my robe is missing. Not one care in mind all year. I find enough joy every day in my hut, and after a meal and a pot of hot tea, I sit on a rock by the pond and count fish. Um, those are all poems in a, in a, in a style that the, the, the Chinese just called shi or a poem. Uh, around 1200, 1300, uh, a lot of Chinese started uh, putting poems to songs. They made it was called lyric poetry, and uh, the most famous, two most famous uh, lyric poets were Li Qingzhao and uh, Xin Qiji. Uh, Li Qingzhao is also the most famous woman poet in Chinese history, and here's a couple of her poems. I recall that sunset by the river pavilion. So drunk, I forgot the way home. Exhilaration fading, rowing back late, losing my way in a sea of lotus flowers, struggling through. Struggling through, I startled a whole sandbar of egrets. And these poems are always, always to, a, to, to a certain tune. Like that poem was to the tune of Ru Meng, Meng Ling, this next one to the tune of Sheng Sheng Man. And it mentions the polonia tree. Uh, the polonia has these huge leaves, so when it rains on them, it makes a, a very loud song. And the Chinese say, when the first polonia leaf falls, the rest aren't fall behind, far behind. I keep searching the horizon cold through and through, desolate and forlorn. It's so hard to feel at peace while the weather keeps changing. How can a few cups of weak wine ward off the evening chill, the geese overhead, a newly broken heart? Yet these are old friends. Piles of chrysanthemums cover the ground, flowers that withered and fell no one can pick now. I watch from the window hoping for nightfall, the polonia in another drizzling rain, drop after drop until dusk. How can the word sorrow do such a scene justice? And so uh, the last two poems are from Xin Ji Ji, the, her male counterpart. They were bo both born in the, the capital of Shandong province, called Jinan, about 30 years apart. So here are two uh, poems by Xin Ji Ji. I didn't know the taste of sadness in my youth. I loved to climb towers. I loved to climb towers. And in my poems, I forced myself to speak of sadness. Knowing the taste of sadness now too well, I start to speak of it, but stop. I start to speak of it, but stop and say instead, what a chilly autumn day. Um, this last poem is called New Year's Eve. And it begins with a description of uh, fireworks. Uh, the Chinese started celebra celebrating fireworks in, uh, on New Year's about the time this poem was written, around the year 1200. And also it has a line in it that it's, it translates simply as a hundred times. But to show you the, the, the sensibility that the Chinese have and respect for poetry, they took that line, and it's the name of the Chinese, of uh, the most famous Chinese search engine. It's the, the Chinese Google is Baidu, 
or a hundred times, and it's taken uh, from this poem by Sin Chi Ji. New Year's Eve. In the east wind last night, a thousand trees burst forth, showered down a rain of stars, jeweled horses, carriages, and incense filled the road. The tremulous sound of a phoenix flute, the transforming glow of a jade cup, all night lanterns swayed, and she of the moth eyebrows and flower-decked hair, whom I have searched for in crowds a hundred times. As I turned my head, she was there where the lantern light was faint. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, for a while, I've been thinking about our list and how you know, we can make things new. And one of the um, ideas I've been puzzling over, you know, kind of extending from um, Horace's um, Ars Poetica, where he says, ut pictura poesis, as does painting, so does poetry. I wanted to investigate the, the ways in which um, image, images, painting, art, um, you know, enters into poetry and vice versa. And going back several years ago, um, you know, we published uh, Paisley Rechtel's book, Imaginary Vessels, where she contemplates photographs of skulls from the Colorado Mental Health Hospital, I think, or Institute. Um, and, and they were just these magical poems alongside um, around, alongside um, visual images, photographs. And, and so I wanted to explore more, more of that. And so fast forward a couple of years and she, uh, she said, okay, I've got a kind of crazy idea. I've been working on this website uh, for the state of Utah about the history of the rail railways in the US and, and you know, how they were built um, largely by black and brown bodies and immigrants uh, who, who um, made, made it possible to you know, uh, supposedly connect to this country. Um, and, and I was particularly intrigued by that because, you know, not so far from the house that I live in, um, there's this beautiful pasture with a lagoon, and in the middle of the lagoon, there's a vestige, there are vestiges of a population that used to live there. Um, and, um, the, the, there are, um, posts for, for oyster farming. Um, this whole area is called the Chinese Gardens. And um, at the turn of the century, Port Townsend, a tiny town now, was actually the sixth largest port of en entry in the United States, um, the majority of them coming from China to build the railways. Um, and just seeing how so close to my own home, this, um, this entire, you know, um, local population had been eradicated through the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, suddenly, you know, this this book that that Paisley was um, was proposing brought it all, you know, very made it very real and brought it home uh, to me. Just in the same way that Bill's Cold Mountain um, makes uh, makes my way every or is is very much a part of my home. But I'm very excited for the first time to see um, some of the the video work and photos that that accompany this. So I wish I were out there being able to see the screen. I won't be able to um, see it so much from my seat. But Paisley, please. Thank you for coming. I'm going to give a poetry reading in which I do nothing. Um, so I was invited as the Utah Poet Laureate to write a poem about the Transcontinental Railroad. And so what I wanted to do was think about the ways that the railroad impacted pretty much every aspect of American life um, and certainly the workers' lives and experiences. And I tried to figure out a frame text. So I chose a poem that had been carved into the walls of Angel Island Immigration Station. So um, this is a book that literally just came out um, and it comes with a QR code. So this is this, uh, we'll go to the website and I can't control anything so I'll just sort of point to them and say what to play. Um, so what I'd like them to do is to first play the opening video which gives you the Chinese poem and uh, the famous maybe it will come on, maybe it will not. Um, there is a famous photograph by A.J. Russell, and it's from the website West, and no one's looking at me like they know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> no? 
No? That you guys don't have? Yes. Hastui a dot at a penanita. Tendo for take a singing. Δεν είμαστε επιβάτες στο τρένο εμείς. Το τρένο είναι επιβάτες που καβαλάει εμάς. This is the sound of a train. No podemos portar a todos los No viajamos en el tren. Αυτό είναι ο ήχος ενός τρένου. Okochi now, if we were playing the website actually together, this would immediately go to the website. That Chinese poem would come up, and you could click on every single character, and it would open up into a poem about one of the workers' histories, documentary poems. The book itself has a long series of essays that actually turn into one essay. I will not read the essays. I'm just going to keep on doing this Las Vegas thing and asking them to play some of the videos. That um, poem is number 111 that was carved into the walls of Angel Island, and it um, it basically elegizes a suicide. Um, some uh, fellow Chinese detainee who had, um, during his detention, killed himself. There were two poems, number 111 and 112, that faced each other. Um, they are a dialogic pair and they're speaking together. There is no 112 that I translate, but I want to think of the book as a sort of mirror of and a dialogue with the site. The second one I want to play is a poem called What Day? One of the things that I was really interested in was thinking about all of the people that we don't think about on the railroad. One of the things that I learned very quickly about um, my research in, about the transcontinental was that there are no records, no letters, no diary entries, nothing written that the Chinese have left. It's not to say that they didn't exist, we just haven't found them. So there's a profound absence in the archive about what a lot of workers experienced. But as I was thinking about all of the different kinds and types of people who were working on the railroad, one absent really really struck out to me, which is that there's a ton of men working on the railroad, but almost no one did any research into LGBTQ lives on the railroad. So the next video I want to play is called What Day? And this is my imagination, potentially, of that worker's experience. What Day? On this seventh day of the seventh month, magpies bridge in a cluster of black and white, the Sky King crosses to meet his queen time tracked by the close-knit wheeling of stars. I watch. You come to me tonight, drunk on wine and cards, nails ridged black with opium to ease the pain of work. We are all men here. Anybody can be a bridge, little raven. Your eyes squeezed shut, but not from pain. We are a trestle, a grade we build together. What matter if you say you'd never choose me, were there women willing in this desert? I chose. I choose the memory we share of rivers, your hair of smoke and raw, wet leather. A man in another man's hand makes himself tool or weapon, says the overseer, as if a man's use to another is only one of work. Pleasure is the only chosen future. You are the home I briefly make, the country I can return to. Here, where the moon wheels its white shoulder in the dark, and you push me to the earth, slip my whiskered tip of hair into your mouth. I just want to say I got to perform that for the Utah State Governor, and that was one of the better moments of my life. 
Um, the next, <laughs> he loved it too. Uh, the next video I want to play is one called Not, and this is spoken by um, Dennis Carney, and you'll learn quite a bit about him from the video. Um, to a certain extent, I don't need to say anything more about it, so if you could play that, that'd be great. Thanks. Not. Dennis Carney, Speeches, 1878. I am not a railroad king, banker, professor, bummer, politician. Under their flag of slaveholder, they have rallied, and we permitted them to grow rich. They have loaded down our nation with debt. They have stolen public lands. By their unprincipled greed brought distress on millions. They, who have resources enough to feed, clothe, and shelter the entire human race, we propose now to take charge. The press will say I am a common Irishman. Good. I am a working man, too, like you, who did not come here as English, Scotch, Dutch, or Irish, not Catholic either, Protestant or infidel. Let there be no sects. We are white working men who will elect the hard-fisted, obscure artisans, coopers, bank smashers. If the legislature oversteps human decency, then rope will be our battle cry. White men, women, girls, and boys will not compete with the mechanics of the market. The Chinese must leave our shores. None but an idiot would hope to work as cheap. None but a slave make the effort. Death is preferable to life on par with these. We make no secret of our intentions. We can discuss if it would be better to hang, shoot, or cut the capitalists to pieces later. Money is always on alert to divide us. But as I walk under this starless heaven, still I know Mars holds its course, Venus whirls in flashing fields of light. Thus it is with a movement of our kind. We are working men, and we will exhibit ourselves when the time is right. Not in lowliness or in shame, but splendor, alive in our true and native powers. anywhere and everywhere. You will not replace us. You will not replace us. You will not replace us. While I was working, uh, excuse me, while I was working on this book, I realized, at first I thought, well, I'm just writing about the transcontinental, I'm writing about the late 19th century, but so many things were paralleling the times that I was living in too, we were all living in, and um, so obviously during the building of the transcontinental, there were cholera epidemics, there were depressions, there were race riots, there were lots of questions about immigration, and there were presidential impeachments, in fact. So um, I talk about that in the notes, but one of the things that I wanted to study too was also the effect of women and um, the ways in which um, certain male experiences obviously are written about or thought about in the railroad, but some of the experiences of women on the railroad have to be considered too. This is a short poem, it's called Hold Sorrow, um, and it's about what would have happened potentially to a number of Chinese women coming over. So hold sorrow, please. Hold sorrow. Imagine a farm, a famine. Your mother promised you'll learn tailoring. Imagine your father pocketing $600. Now here's the boat, its black planks wet with fog. Here is the room holding a bed, no mirror, your wash basin. You have one window wired to face the street. He will keep his pants on, his greasy shirt, his shoes. Imagine the quarter pressed after into your palm. Your street will be named for presidents you never heard of, the city's lights like strings of blood in puddles. Imagine, if you could, you'd carve your father's name on a knife tip. At night, only the train cries. Your door locks from the outside. Two last poems, and so... Um... I will actually read something so it doesn't look like I'm just sitting up here, um, which I totally am. Um, 
So one of the things I wanted to think about were the people who were writing the rails legally still. So I ended up doing some oral history work with people who call themselves writers. We used to call them hobos. Um, so people who basically are still out there riding the train illegally. And this is a persona poem in their voice. Um, I will say one thing about it that it is actually kind of difficult to read, and you'll hear why. Dead. Dead is what they call a torn up track whose living rails I jump to bed down in the wells and feel the thud hit every trestle steam at dawn like horses at the track I trained before the Phillies foundered sick they fired the agents vets they fired the riders me I love how in a well you thrum with sound until your bare lips start to bleed like canisters of oil I stole inside the train you'll find a nation what it wants to eat and wear and what it likes to buy a ring a phone some jeans of course there is no reason why to jump a train except to lose the edges of yourself the time like pacing moxie at the track that speed that almost tears your hands off at the wrist she was the last to go her tendon bowed and worthless than insurance no one rides a race for just for pleasure. No one hops a train if they can take a plane, a car whose engine speed is gauged by horses kept alive in memory for sentiment. I guess there's ghosts of what we were and are. We cannot bear to leave out in the desert where I'm going home. Just not right now, I said of Moxie. Not right now before the race. She hasn't many left in her. You know she trusts you, right? The owner said, let's let me two grand down the shots. Thank you. Um, and the last poem... Uh, I, I wanted not to have any pictures of myself in any of the videos, but um, as I was working on this book and thinking about the ideas of United East and West and what the transcontinental promised to do and what it didn't do, I was thinking about, obviously, my own identity as a biracial woman who is Chinese, Norwegian, um, white, Asian, the idea of uniting things and then maybe these things also splitting apart at the same time they are united. The last poem um, is called Heart. And so I, I always, I both love and kind of detest this video because it's my big head that will show up in it. But um, there's also in the videos some images um, that are really precious to me because they're from my grandfather's photo album when he came over um, to the United States when he immigrated. So this is Heart, and it's the final poem. Heart. I remember the boy who called me dirty and the French women who hissed pauvre petite as I passed on the street. And I remember the girl like me at school who pasted her face with white paint and blacked her brows to pass, she said, as Mexican. I remember everything for which I was made to feel ashamed. Even the fact my father said I would never make half the woman my mother was because of my heart which the doctor now calls unusually large. Memory is the weakness I bear on my own. I come from a race on my mother's side said to be the most stolid and insensible, yet feels so keenly alive to suffering, it hurts to hear the words strangers use for Chinese shopkeepers, or watch the Chinamen here laugh when I say I am of their race. I who, but for a few phrases, remain unacquainted with my mother tongue. I have the name my English father gave me, and I look like my father. I could be loved if I lived as if I were like him, too. But I prefer the name I have invented for myself. I want the world to see my mother in me, regardless if the Chinese have no souls. I do not need a soul. It is not my soul in question here, and these hot glances, these furious whispers. Why care for love when I do not know if I should love others in return? Love is a white loneliness that swells the heart and shuts me out from pleasure. What is there for one like me to do but wander, a pioneer traveling between west and east, myself the link they threaten, to destroy between them. I do not need a name on legal papers. Here is a match. Here is the mirror in which my pale face burns its flickering allegiances. My soul is everywhere on my person. I lose nothing of myself that has not already disappeared.
So I think we're actually out of time for uh, the question and answers that we were going to do, but you can certainly uh, ask the, the poets and translators um, outside as they're signing books if you have any of your own. But um, thank you again for all coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the rest of the conference. If you'd please give the presenters about 10 minutes to get settled out by the tables, um, they'll be signing their books out there. Thank you.